On Prayer in the Contemplative Life Part 9 Chapter 6 Is the act of contemplation rightly distinguished according to the three kinds of motion, circular, direct, and oblique? St. Denis the Arapagite does so distinguish the acts of contemplation. The operation of the intellect, in which the contemplation essentially consists in the term motion, is the sense that motion is the act of a perfect thing, according to the philosopher, and since we arrive at a knowledge of intelligible things through the medium of the things of sense, and the operation of the senses do not take place without motion, it follows that the operation also of the intellect are correctly described as a species of motion and are differentiated according to the analogy of diverse motions. But the more perfect and the chiefest of body motions are the local motions, as is proved by the philosopher. Consequently, the chief intellectual motions are described according to the analogy of these later. Now, there are three species of local motion. One is circular, according to a thing is moved uniformly about the same center. Another is direct, according to a thing proceeds from one point to another. And a third is oblique compounded, as it were, from two foregoing. Hence, in intelligible operations, that which simply has uniformity is attributed to circular motion, that intellectual motion by which a man proceeds from one thing to another is attributed to direct motion. Well, that intellectual operation which has a certain uniformity combined with progress towards different points, is attributed to oblique motion. All, however, do not agree with this division. Thus, 1. Contemplation means a state of repose, as is said in Wisdom. When I go into my house, I shall repose myself with her. And motion is opposed to repose. Consequently, the operations of the contemplative life cannot be designated according to these different species of motion. But whereas external bodily movements are opposed to the repose of contemplation, which is understood to be rest from external occupations, the motion of intellectual operations belongs precisely to the repose of contemplation. 2. Again, the action of the contemplative life pertains to the intellect, wherein man is at one with the angels. But St. Denis does not apply these motions to the angels in the same way as he does to the soul. For he says that circular motion of the angels correspond to the illumination of the beautiful and the good. But the circular motion of the soul he gives several definitions of which the first is the return of the soul upon itself as opposed to external things. The second is a certain wrapping together of the powers of the soul whereby it is freed from error and from external occupation. And the third is union of the soul with things superior to it. Similarly, he speaks in different terms of the direct motion of the soul as compared with that of the angels. For he says that the direct motion of an angel is according as he proceeds to the care of things subject to him, while the direct motion of the soul is made to consist of two things. First of all, that it proceeds to those things which are around it. Secondly, that external things is it is uplifted to simple contemplation and lastly he explains the oblique motion differently in each case for he makes the oblique motion of the angels consist in this that while providing for those that have less than themselves <clears throat> 
they remain in the same attitude towards God. But the oblique motion of the soul he explains as a meaning that the soul is illumined by divine knowledge and diffusely. Consequently, it does not appear that the operations of contemplation are fittingly distinguished according to the aforesaid species of motion. But while man's intellect is generally the same with that of the angels, the intellectual powers of the latter have far higher than in man. It was therefore necessary to assign the aforesaid motions of human souls and to angels in different fashion in proportion as their intellectual powers are not uniform. For the angelic intellect has uniform knowledge in two respects. Firstly, because the angels do not acquire intelligible truth from the variety of compound things, and secondly, because they do not understand intelligible truth discursively, but by simple intuition. Whereas the intellect of the human soul, on the contrary, acquires in intelligible truth from the things of sense, and understands it by the discursive action of the reason. Hence, St. Denis assigns to the angels circular motion in that they uniformly and unceasingly, without beginning or end, gaze upon God, just as circular motion, which has neither beginning nor end, is uniformly maintained round the same central point. But in the case of the human soul, its twofold lack of uniformity must be removed before it can to the above-mentioned uniformity. For there must first be removed that lack of uniformity which arises from the diversity of external things, that is, the soul must quit external things. And this St. Denis expresses first of all in his definition of the circular motion of the soul when he speaks of the return of the soul upon itself as opposed to external things. There must be removed in the second place that second lack of uniformity which arises from the discursive action of the reason, and this takes place when all the operations of the soul are reduced to the simple contemplation of intelligible truth. This forms the second part of St. Denis's definition of the circular motion, namely when he speaks of the necessity of a certain wrapping together of the powers of the soul, with the result that, when discursive action thus ceases, the soul's gaze is fixed upon the contemplation of the one simple truth. And in this operation of the soul there is no room for error, just as there is no room for error in the understanding of first principles which we know by simple intuition. Then, when the first two steps have taken St. Denis, puts in the third place of that uniformity, like to that of the angels, by which the soul, laying aside all else, persists in the simple contemplation of God. And this he expresses when he says, Then, as now made uniform, as it as a whole, that is, as conformed to God, is, with all its powers unified, led by the hand to the beautiful and the good. But the direct motion of the angels cannot be understood in the sense that, by considering, they proceed from one point to another, but solely according to the order of their providential care for others, accordingly, namely, that the superior angels illumine the inferior through those who stand between. And this is what St. Denis means when he says the direct motion of an angel is according as he proceeds to the care of the thing subject to him, taking in his course all things that are direct, following, that is, those things which are disposed to in direct order. But to the human soul, St. Denis assigns direct motion in the sense that it proceeds from the exterior things of sense 
to the knowledge of the intelligible things, and he assigns oblique motion to the angels, a motion that is compounded of the direct and the circular, inasmuch as an angel, according to his contemplation of God, provides for those inferior to him, to the human soul, on the contrary, he assigns the same oblique motion, similarly compounded of the direct and the circular motions, inasmuch as its reasonings it makes use of the divine illuminations. 3. Lastly, Victor, Richard of St. Victor gives many others and different kinds of motion. For following the analogy of the birds of the air, he says of these latter that some at one time ascend on high, at another swoop down to the earth, and they do this again and again. Others turn now to the right, now to the left, and this repeatedly. Others go in advance, others fall behind. Some sail round and round in circles, now narrower and now wider, while again remain almost immovably suspended in one place. From all that which it would seem that there are not merely three movements in contemplation, but all these diversities of motion which are expressed by up and down, to the right and left, backwards and forwards, and in varying circles, are reducible either to direct or to oblique motion. For they all signify the discursive action of the reason. For if this discursive action be from the genus to the species, or from the whole to the part, it will be, as Richard of St. Victor explained, himself explains, motion upwards and downwards. If, again, it means argumentation from one thing to its opposite, it will come under motion to, to right and left. Or if it be a deduction from cause or to effect, then it will be motion backwards and forwards. And, finally, if it means arguing from the accidents which surround a thing, neither nearly or remotely, it will be circuitous motion. But the discursive action of the reason, arguing from the things of sense to the intelligible things according to the orderly progress of natural reason, belong to direct motion. When, however, it arises from divine illuminations, it comes under oblique motion, as we have already said in the reply to the second argument. Lastly, only the immobility which he mentions will come under circular motion. Whence it appears that St. Denis had quite sufficiently and with exceeding subtlety described the movements of contemplation. For behold, my witness is in heaven, and that he knoweth my conscience is on high. For behold, short years pass away, and I am walking in a path by which I shall not return. Chapter 7 Has Contemplation Its Joys? In Wisdom 8 we read, Her conversation hath no bitterness, nor her company any tediousness, but joy and gladness. As St. Gregory says, the contemplative life means a truly lovable sweetness. There are two sources of pleasure in contemplation. First, there is the very act of contemplating, and everyone finds a certain pleasure in the performance of acts which are appropriate to his nature or to his habits. And the contemplation of truth is natural to a man, as a rational animal. Hence, it is all that men naturally desire to know, and this consequently finds a pleasure in the knowledge of truth, and this pleasure is enhanced according as a man has habits of wisdom and knowledge which enable him to indulge in contemplation, 
without difficulty. Secondly, the contemplation is pleasurable owing to the object which we contemplate, as when a man looks at something which he loves. And this holds good of even a bodily vision, for not only is the mere exercise of the visual faculties pleasurable, but the seeing people whom we love is pleasurable. Since, then, the contemplative life especially consists in the contemplation of God, to which contemplation we are moved by charity, it follows that the contemplative life is not merely pleasurable by reason of the simple fact of contemplating, but also by reason of the divine love itself. And in both these respects, the delights of contemplation exceed all other human delights. For, on the one hand, spiritual delights are superior to carnal delights, and, on the other hand, the love of divine charity wherewith we love God exceeds all other love. Whence it is said in the psalm, Taste and see that the Lord is sweet. Some maintain, however, that contemplation is not pleasurable. Thus, 1. Pleasure belongs to the appetitive powers, whereas contemplation is mainly in the intellect. But while the contemplative life mainly consists in the intellect, it derives its principle from the affective powers. Since man is moved to contemplation by love of God, and since the end corresponds to the principle, it follows that the goal and term of the contemplative life is in the affective powers, in the sense, namely, that man finds pleasure in the sight of a thing he loves, and this very pleasure stirs up in him yet a greater love. Hence St. Gregory says, when a man sees one whom he loves, his love is yet more enkindled. And in this lies the full perfection of the contemplative life, that this divine truth should not only be seen, but loved. 2. Again, strife and contention inner delight. But in contemplation there is strife and contention. For St. Gregory says, The soul, when it strives after the contemplation of God, finds itself engaged in a species of combat. At one time it seems to prevail, for by understanding and by feeling it tastes somewhat of the infinite light. At other times it is overwhelmed, for when it has tasted, it faints. It is true, indeed, that contest and strife arising from the opposition presented by external things prevent us from finding pleasure in those same things. But no man finds a pleasure in the things against which he fights. But he does find a pleasure, other things being equal, in the actual attainment of a thing for which he has striven. Thus St. Augustine says, The greater the danger in the battle, the greater the joy in the triumph. And in contemplation the strife and the combat do not arise from any opposition on the part of the truth which we contemplate, but from our deficient understanding and from the corruptible nature of our bodies, which ever draw us down to things beneath us. The corruptible body is a load upon the soul, and the earthly habitation presseth down the mind that museth upon many things. Hence it is that when a man attains the contemplation of truth he loves still more ardently, but at the same time he uses more than ever Hates his, hates his own defects and the sluggishness of his corruptible body, so that with the apostle he cries out, Unhappy man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Hence, too, 
St. Gregory says, When God is known by our desires and our understanding, He causes all pleasure of the flesh to wither up within us. 3. But again, delight follows upon a perfect work, but contemplation on this earth is imperfect, according to the words of the Apostle, we see now through a glass in a dark manner. Hence it would seem that the contemplative life does not afford delight. It is indeed true that the contemplation of God during this life is imperfect, compared with our contemplation of Him in our eternal home. But in the same way it is true that the delights of contemplation here on earth are imperfect compared with the delights of contemplation in that home, of which latter joys the psalmist, they shall make them drink the torrent of thine pleasure. Nevertheless, the contemplation of divine things here on earth, although imperfect, far more perfect than any other subject of contemplation, whosoever perfect it may be by this reason of the excellence of what we could contemplate, whether the philosopher says, it may indeed be the case that with regard to such noble existences and divine substances, we have to be content with the insignificant theories, yet even though we but barely touch upon them, none the less so ennobling is such knowledge that it affords us greater delight than any other which is accessible to us. Hence, too, St. Gregory says, the contemplative life has its most desirable sweetness. Hence, too, St. Gregory says, the contemplative life has its most desirable sweetness, which uplifts the soul above itself, opens the way to heavenly things, and makes spiritual things plain to the eyes of the soul. 4. Lastly, bodily injuries are a hindrance to delight, but contemplation is productive of bodily injuries, for we read in Genesis that Jacob, after saying, I have seen God face to face, halted on his foot, because he touched the sinew of his thigh and it shrank. Whence it would seem that the contemplative life is not pleasurable. But after that contemplation, Jacob halted on one foot, because, as St. Gregory said, it must needs be that, as the love of his world goes weaker, so a man grows stronger in his love of God. And, consequently, when once we have known the sweetness of God, one of our feet remains sound while the other halts, for a man who halts with one foot leans only on the one that is sound. St. Gregory between the delights of the body and those of the heart, there is this difference that the delights of the body are wont, when we have them not, to beget a king yearning for them, and when we have them and eat our fill, they straightway beget disgust for them, for we are sated therewith. Spiritual joys, on the contrary, when we have them not are not a weariness, but we have them, we still desire them more, and the more we feed upon them, the more hunger we are after them. But in the case of the former, the yearning for them was a pleasure, trial of them brought disgust. In the case of the latter, in desire as we held them cheap, trial of them proved a source of pleasure. For spiritual joys increase the soul's desire of them, even while they sate us. For the more their Saviour is perceived, the more we know what it is we ought eagerly to love. Whence it comes to pass that when we have them not, we cannot love them, for their Saviour is unknown to us. How can a man love what he is ignorant of?
Therefore the psalmist admonishes us, saying, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is sweet, as though he would say to us in play terms, You know not his sweetness, if ye have never tasted. Touch, then, the food of life with the palate of your soul, that so, making proof of its sweetness, ye may be able to love it. These joys man lost when he sinned in paradise. He went out when he closed his mouth to the food of eternal sweetness. Whence we too, who are born amidst the toils of this pilgrimage, come without relish to this food. We know not what we ought to desire, and the sickness of our disgust grows the more the further our souls keep away from feeding upon that sweetness and less and less does our soul desire those interior joys, the longer it has grown accust accustomed to do without them. We, sick we sicken, then, by reason of our very disgust, and we are wearied by the long-drawn sickness of our hunger. 8. Is the contemplative life lasting? The Lord said, Mary hath chosen the best part which shall not be taken away from her, because, as St. Gregory says, contemplation begins here below, that it may be perfected in our heavenly home. A thing may be termed lasting in two ways, from its very nature, or as far as we are concerned, as far as its nature is concerned, the contemplative life is lasting in two ways. For first of all it is concerned with incorruptible and unchangeable things, and in the second place there is nothing which is contrary. For, as Aristotle says, to the pleasure which is derived from thought there is no contrary. And also, as far as we are concerned with the contemplative life is lasting, and this both, because it comes under the action of the incorruptible portion of our soul, namely our intellect, so we can last after this life, and also because in the work of the contemplative life there is no bodily toil, we can consequently apply ourselves more continuously to such work, as the philosopher remarks. Some, however, argue that the contemplative life is not lasting. Thus, 1. The contemplative life is essentially concerns the intellect, but all the intellectual perfections of this life will be made void, as we read, whether prophecies shall be void, or tongues shall cease, or knowledge shall be destroyed. But the fashion of contemplation here and in our Father's home is not the same, and the contemplative life is said to last by reason of charity, which is both its principle and its end. Wherefore, St. Gregory says, the contemplative life begins here, below, so that it may be perfected in our heavenly home, for the fire of love which begins to burn here below when it sees him whom it loves, burns yet more strongly with love of him. 2. Again, men but taste the sweetness of contemplation here, snatching, as it were, in passing. Whence St. Augustine says, Thou introducedest me to the most unwanted affection within me, to an unspeakable sweetness. Yet I fall back again as though dragged down by grievous weight. And St. Gregory expounding those words of Job, when a spirit passes before me, says, The mind does not remain steadfastly occupied with the sweetness and in intimate contemplation, for it is recalled to such, stricken back by the immensity of that light. The contemplative life, then, is not lasting. It is true, indeed, that no action can remain long at the pitch of its intensity, and the goal of contemplation is to attain to the uniformity of divine contemplation. 
as Dennis the Arapagite says. Hence, although in this sense contemplation cannot long last, yet it can long last as regards to its other acts. 3. Lastly, what is not natural to a man cannot be lasting. But the contemplative life, as the philosopher says, is beyond man. But the philosopher says that the contemplative life is beyond man, in the sense that it belongs to us according to what is divine in us, namely our intellect. For our intellect is incorruptible and impassable in itself, and consequently its action can be more lasting. St. Augustine This day sets before us the great mystery of our eternal beatitude. For that day which this day signifies will not pass away as today is to pass away. Therefore, brethren, we exhort and beseech thee by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom our sins are forgiven, by him who willed that his blood should be our ransom, by him who has deigned that we who are not deserving to be called his slaves should yet be called his brother. We beseech you that your entire aim, that which gives you the very name of Christian, and by reason of which you bear upon his name, upon your foreheads and your hearts, may be directed solely to that life which we are to share with the angels, that life where there is unending repose, everlasting joy, failing, unfailing happiness, rest without disturbance, joy without sadness, no death. What that life is none can know, save those who have made a special trial of it, and none can make trial of it save those who have faith. And you shall say in that day, I will give thanks to thee, O Lord, for thou wast angry with me. Thy wrath is turned away, and thou hast comforted me. Behold, God is my Savior. I will deal confidently, and will not fear, because the Lord is my strength, and my praise, and he has become my salvation. You shall draw the waters with joy out of the Saviour's fountains, and you shall say in that day, Praise ye the Lord, and call upon his name. Make his works known among the people. Remember that his name is high. Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath done great things. Show this forth in all the earth. Rejoice and praise, O thou habitation of Zion, for great is he that in the midst of thee, the Holy One of Israel. Question 181 Of the Act of Life 1. Do all acts of the moral virtues come under the act of life? St. Isidore says, in the act of life, all the vices are first of all to be removed by the practice of good works, so that in the contemplative life a man may, with now purified mental gaze, pass to the contemplation of the divine light. But all the vices can only be removed by the acts of moral virtues. Consequently, the acts of the moral virtues belong to the act of life. As we have already said, the active and the contemplative lives are distinguished by the different occupations of men who are aiming at different ends, one being the consideration of truth, the goal of the contemplative life, the other external works with which the active life is occupied. But it is clear that the moral virtue are not especially concerned with the contemplation of truth, but with action. Thus the philosopher says, For virtue, knowledge is of little or no avail. It is therefore manifest that the moral virtues essentially belong to the act of life. 
and in the accordance with this the philosopher refers the moral virtues to active happiness. Some, however, maintain that all the acts of the moral virtues do not belong to the active life. Thus, 1. The active life seems to consist solely in those things which have to do with our neighbor. For, St. Gregory says, the active life means breaking bread to the hungry. And at the close, after enumerating many things which have to do with our neighborhood, he adds, and to provide for each according as they have need, but not by all the acts of the moral virtues are we brought into contact with others, but only by justice and its divisions. Consequently, all the acts of the moral virtues do not belong to the act of life. But the chief of the moral virtues is justice, and by it a man is brought into contact with his neighbor, as the philosopher proves. We describe, then, the act of life by those things by which we are brought into contact with our neighbor. Yet we do not thereby mean that the act of life consists solely in these things, but chiefly in them. 2. Again, St. Gregory says, By Leah, who was blear-eyed but fruitful, is signified the act of life which sees less clearly, since occupied with works, but when, now by word, now by example, it arouses its neighbor to imitation, it brings forth many children in good works. But all this seems rather to come under charity, by which we love our neighbor, than under the moral virtues, consequently the acts of the moral view virtues seem not to belong to the active life. But a man can, by acts of all the moral virtues, lead his neighbor to good works by his example, and this St. Gregory here attributes to the active life. 3. Lastly, the moral virtues dispose us to the contemplative life, but disposition to a thing and the perfect attainment of that thing come under the same head. Consequently, the moral virtues do not belong to the act of life. But just as a virtue, which is directed towards the end of another virtue, passes over, in some sort, into the species of the latter virtue, so also seems when a man uses those things which belong to the act of life, precisely as disposing him to contemplation, then those things which he uses are comprised under the contemplative life. But for those who devote themselves to the works of the moral writers as being good in themselves and not as dispositive towards the contemplative life, the moral virtues belong to the active life although at the same time it might be said that the active life is a disposition to the contemplative life. O oh, death, how bitter is the remembrance of thee to a man that hath peace in his possessions, to a man that is at rest, and whose ways are prosperous in all things, and that is yet able to take meat. O oh, death, thy sentence is welcome to the man that is indeed, and to him whose strength faileth, he who is in a decrepit age, and that is in care about all things, and to the distrustful that loseth patience. Fear not the sentence of death. Remember what things have been before thee, and what shall come after thee. This sentence is from the Lord upon all flesh, and what shall come upon thee by the good pleasure of the Most High, when ten, or a hundred, or a thousand years? 2. Does prudence pertain to the act of life? The philosopher says that prudence pertains to the act of happiness, and to pertain to the moral virtues. As we have said, 
When one thing is directed towards the attainment of one thing at its end, it, and this especially holds, good in morals, is, so to speak, drawn into the species of that towards it which it is thus directed. Thus, he who commits adultery in order to steal, says the philosopher, is rather a thief than an adulterer. Now it is clear that knowledge which is prudence is directed to the acts of moral virtues as it ends, for prudence is the right mode of procedure in our actions. Hence, too, the ends of the moral virtues are the principles of prudence, as the philosopher also says in the same work. In the same way, then, as we said above that in the case of a man who directs them to the repose of contemplation, the moral virtues pertain to the contemplative life, so also the knowledge which is prudence and which is by its very nature directed to the operations of the moral virtues directly pertains to the active life, that is, of course, on the supposition that prudence is understood in the strict sense in which the philosopher speaks of it. If, however, prudence be understood in a broad sense, namely as embracing all kinds of human knowledge, then prudence pertains, at least in certain aspects, to the contemplative life. Thus, Cicero says, The man who can see a truth the most clearly and quickly, and explain the reason of it, is rightly regarded as most prudent and most wise. But some maintain that prudence does not pertain to the active life. Thus, 1. Just as the contemplative life pertains to the cognitive powers, so does the active life pertain to the appetitive powers. But prudence does not pertain to the appetitive powers, but rather to the cognoscitive. Consequently, it does not pertain to the active life. But moral acts derive their character from the end, towards which they are directed. Consequently, with the contemplative life belongs that kind of knowledge which makes its end consist in the very knowledge of truth. But the knowledge which is prudence, which is rather directed to the acts of the appetitive powers, pertains to the active life. 2. Again, St. Gregory says, The active life, occupied as it is with work, sees less clearly, and hence is typified by Leah, who was blear-eyed. But prudence demands a clear vision, so that a man may judge what is to be done. Hence it would seem that prudence does not pertain to the act of life. But occupation with external things only makes a man see less clearly those intelligible truths which are not connected with the things of sense. The external occupation of the act of life, however, make a man see more clearly in his judgment on a course of action, and this is a question of prudence. For he has experience, and his mind is attentive. When you are attentive, says Salust, then mental acumen avails. 3. Lastly, prudence comes midway betwixt the moral and the intellectual virtues. But just as the moral virtues pertain to the act of life, so do the intellectual virtues pertain to the contemplative. Hence it would seem that prudence belongs neither to the active nor to the contemplative life, but, as St. Augustine says, to a kind of life which is betwixt and between. But prudence is said to come down betwixt the intellectual and the moral virtues, in the sense that, whereas it has the same subject as the intellectual virtues, yet it coincides as regards its object with moral values. And that third species of life comes betwixt and between the active and contemplative life, 
as regards the things with which it is concerned, for at one time it is occupied with the contemplation of truth, at another time with external manners. For what shall I do when God shall rise to judge? And when he shall examine, what shall I answer him? For I have always feared God's as swelling over me, and his weight was not able to bear. 3. Does teaching belong to the active or to the contemplative life? St. Gregory says, The active life means breaking bread to the hungry, the teaching of words of wisdom to them and know them not. The act of teaching has a twofold object, for teaching is by speaking, and speaking is the audible sign of an interior mental concept. One object, therefore, of our teaching is the manner to be taught, the object, that is, of our interior concepts. And in this sense, teaching sometimes belongs to the active, sometimes to the contemplative life. It belongs to the active life if a man forms interiorly some concept of a truth with a view to this, thus directing his external acts. But it belongs to the contemplative life of a, if a man interiorly conceives some intelligible truths and delights in the thought of it and the love of it. Whence St. Augustine says, Let them choose for themselves the better part, that, namely, of the contemplative life. Let them devote themselves to the word of God, let them yearn for the sweetness of teaching. Let them occupy themselves with the knowledge that leads to salvation, where he clearly says that teaching belongs to the contemplative life. The second object of teaching arises from the fact that teaching is given through the medium of audi audible speech, and thus the hearer himself is the object of the teaching. And from this point of view, all teaching belongs to the act of life, to which pertain all external actions. Some, however, regard teaching as rather belonging to the contemplative than to the active. Thus, one, St. Gregory says, The perfect men declare to their brethren those good things in heaven which are they themselves have been able to contemplate at least through a glass, and thus kindle in their hearts the love of that hidden beauty. Yet what is this but teaching? To teach, therefore, is an act of the contemplative life. But St. Gregory expressly speaks here of teaching from the point of view of the matter that is presented, that is, of teaching as it is concerned with the consideration of love and love the truth. Again, acts and habits seem to belong to the same kind of life, but each act to teach is an act of wisdom, for the volunteer says, the proof that man knows that he is able to teach, since, then, wisdom, that is, knowledge, pertains to the contemplative life, it would seem that teaching must also pertain to the contemplative life. But habits and acts agree in their object, and consequently the argument is just given and based upon the material of the interior concept. For the capacity for teaching is possessed by a wise or learned man just in proportion as he can express in outward words the concept of his mind and so be able to bring home a truth to someone else. 3. Lastly, prayer is an act of the contemplative life just in the same way as contemplation itself. But prayer, even when one man prays for another, belongs to the contemplative life. Hence it would seem that when one man brings to the knowledge of some another truth upon which he has meditated, such an act pertains to the contemplative life. But he who prays for another in no way acts upon him for whom he prays, his acts are directed towards God alone, the intelligible truth. But he who teaches another does 
act upon him by two external action. First, there is no parallel between the two cases. Chapter 4. Does the act of life continue after this life? St. Gregory says, The act of life passes away with this present world. The contemplative life begins here so as to be perfected in our heavenly home. As already said, the act of life makes its end consist in external actions, and these, if they are directed towards the repose of contemplation, already belong to the contemplative life. But in the future life of the blessed, all occupation with external things will cease. If there are any external acts, they will be directed towards that end, which is contemplation. Hence, St. Augustine says at the close of his Of the City of God, There shall be at rest from toil. We shall gaze, we shall love, we shall praise. And he had just previously said, There will God be seen unendingly, be loved without wearying, be praised without fatigue. This duty, this disposition of soul, this act will be the lot of all. Some, however, maintain that the act of life will be continued after this life. Thus, 1. To the act of life belong the acts of moral virtues, but the moral virtues remain after death, as St. Augustine says. But the acts of the moral virtues, which are concerned with the means to the end, will not remain after death, but only those which have to do with the end itself. Yet it is precisely these latter which go to form the repose of contemplation, to which St. Augustine alludes in the above-quoted passage, where he speaks of being at rest from toil. And this rest is not to be understood of freedom from merely external circumstances, but also from the internal conflict of the passions. 2. Again, to teach others pertains to the act of life, but in the next life, where we shall be as the angels, there can be teaching. For we see it in the case of the angels of whom one illumines, clarifies, and perfects another, all of which refer to the reception of knowledge, as is clear from Dennis the Oropagite. Hence it seems that the active life is to be continued after this life. But the contemplative life especially consists in the contemplation of God, and as regards this no angel teaches another. For it is said of the angels, of the little ones, angels who are in inferior choir, that they always see the face of the Father. And similarly, in the future life, there no man will teach another about God, for we shall all see him as he is. And this agrees with the words of Jeremiah, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. But when it is question of dispensing the mysteries of God, then one angel can teach another by clarifying, illumining, and perfecting. And in this sense the angels do in some sort share in the act of life as long as this world lasts, for they are occupied with ministering to the inferior creation. This is what was signified by Jacob's vision of the angels ascending the ladder, whereby was meant the contemplative life, and descending the ladder, whereby was meant the active life. At the same time, as St. Gregory says, not that they so went out from the divine wisdom as to be deprived of the joys of contemplation. And thus, in their case, the act of life is not distinguished from the contemplative, as it is in us who find the works of the act of life an impediment to the contemplative life. 
Moreover, we are not promised a likeness to the angels in their work of administering to the inferior creation, for this does not belong to us according to our nature, as is the case with the angels, but according to our vision of God. 3. Lastly, the more durable a thing is, the more capable it seems of lasting after this life. But the act of life is more durable than the contemplative, for, St. Gregory says, we can remain steadfast in the act of life, but in no wise can we maintain the mind's fixed gaze in the contemplative life. Consequently, the act of life is much more capable of continuing after death than is the contemplative life. But in our present state, the durability of the act of life as compared with the contemplative life does not arise from any feature of either of these kinds of life considered in themselves, but from a defect on our part. For we are dragged down from the heights of contemplation by the body's burden. And thus St. Gregory goes on to say that, thrust back by its very weakness from those very vast heights, the soul relapses into itself. O oh, bless ye our God, ye Gentiles, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, who had set my soul to live and hath not suffered by feet to be moved. For thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us by fire, as silver is tried. Thou hast brought us into a net. Thou hast laid afflictions on our back. Thou hast set men over our heads. We have passed through fire and water, and thou hast brought us out into a refreshment. <laughs>